Welcome to Music History Monday for January 30th, 2023. I'm Bob Greenberg, and the title for today's podcast is Francis Poulenc, A Bit of Monk and a Bit of Hooligan. If you haven't already, please consider joining me on my subscription site at patreon.com slash Robert Greenberg Music where I blog, vlog, podcast, pontificate, review, and bloviate four to six times a week. We mark the death on January 30th, 1963, exactly 60 years ago today, of the French composer and pianist Francis Jean-Marcel Poulenc in Paris, a Parisian from head to toe, He was born in the très chic 8th arrondissement in that magnificent city on January 7, 1899. He died of a heart attack not far from where he'd been born, in his flat opposite the Luxembourg Gardens in Paris's 6th arrondissement. Before we can get down with the magnifique Monsieur Poulenc, we have an important event in rock and roll history to mark. On January 30th, 1969, 54 years ago today, the Beatles, joined by the keyboard player Billy Preston, performed their final live concert. The venue was unusual. A hastily constructed stage on the rooftop of their five-story Apple Corps, their record company, headquarters at 3 Savile Row, smack dab in the middle of the fashion district in London's Tony Mayfair neighborhood. I cannot resist the joke. How do you get a rock band onto the roof? You tell them the beer is on the house. Bada boom. A couple of weeks before the rooftop concert eventually took place, Paul McCartney had suggested that the Beatles should perform a concert, quote, in a place we're not allowed to do it, like we should trespass, go in, set up, and then get moved, getting forcibly ejected, still trying to play your numbers, and the police lifting you." Unquote. The shock value of such a concert was sure to generate awesome publicity for the Beatles just released on January 13, 1969, Yellow Submarine album. Still, it wasn't until January 26th, just four days before the concert, that the Beatles and their management decided to go ahead with their impromptu rooftop recital. No announcement of the event was made ahead of time. Instead, the Beatles and Billy Preston took their places on the rooftop stage and started playing at around 12.30 p.m., smack dab in the middle of London's lunchtime break with lots of people out and about. Word quickly spread that a sensational event was taking place on Savile Row, and it wasn't the opening of a new haberdashery. After all, the Beatles had not played in public for two and a half years, not since their performance at San Francisco's Candlestick Park on August 29th, 1966. Crowds quickly began to assemble in the surrounding streets and in the windows and on the roofs of surrounding buildings. Yeah, so much for George Harrison's fear that they would be performing, quote, only for chimneys, unquote. Soon enough, streets became impassable and the doors to businesses blocked. Given that the blocked streets included Savile Row and Regent Street, the latter a major thoroughfare, and that the blocked businesses constituted some of the ritziest in the city, not everyone was overjoyed with the spontaneous concert. As the Beatles and their people had anticipated, the Metropolitan Police came a-knocking. A film crew captured the police arriving en masse in the lobby of the Apple Corps offices to stop the performance. But the Apple Corps employees had been instructed to keep the police at bay in the reception area for as long as they could, and this they did, until they were threatened with arrest. 
the Metropolitans stormed the makeshift stage, turning off the amplifiers. The Beatles and their people simply turned them back on again. Properly intimidated by the entire scene, the police allowed the musicians to finish their 42-minute set, which included multiple takes of Get Back, Don't Let Me Down, I've Got a Feeling, The One After 909, and Dig a Pony. John Lennon concluded the performance by saying, quote, I'd like to say thank you on behalf of the group and ourselves, and I hope we passed the audition. Now, please, the Beatles didn't go through all of this trouble just to entertain people on their lunch break and muck up the traffic. The audio of their performance was fed into the basement studio there at Apple Corps, where it was recorded on two eight-track tape machines. At the same time, six cameras recorded the performance on the rooftop. Another camera was placed, without permission, so we are told, on the roof of a building across the street. Two cameras were placed below on the street itself in order to record reactions from pedestrians. And yet another camera was placed, hidden, behind a two-way mirror in Apple Corps reception area on the ground floor to capture the inevitable police invasion of the building. That footage of the event has been used in a number of productions. In the documentary film Let It Be, from 1970. In the documentary series The Beatles Get Back, from 2022. And in the Disney IMAX production The Beatles Get Back, The Rooftop Concert, 2022. The audio of the complete performance was released for streaming on January 28, 2022, under the title, Get Back the Rooftop Performance. Because we must, we must sample the concert with the Beatles' performance of Don't Let Me Down. Given that the police are already present on the roof, an alternative title for the song might be Don't Shut Me Down. A link is provided. A random observation. Performing on a rooftop on a gray, windy London winter's day? Those guys must have been really cold. Francis Poulenc. Again, we mark the death on January 30th, 1963, 60 years ago today, of the French composer and pianist Francis Poulenc. Long considered a compositional lightweight, a composer for whom, heaven forbid, traditional tonality, beautiful melody, and musical charm assumed pride of compositional place. Poulenc's music was routinely rejected by the Academy and by the modernists that dominated the musical scene in the years after the end of World War II in 1945. Over the last 40 years, my personal opinion of Poulenc's music has traversed a full 180 degrees. As a young, academy-trained composer, I adopted my teacher's various prejudices against French music without question. Among other things, this meant that with the exception of the music of Claude Debussy and Pierre Boulez, pretty much all French music going back to the 17th century was considered beneath contempt, and none more so than that of the loose group of Gallic compositional confectioners known as Les Six, the Six, a group that included Francis Poulenc. The members of the Six were all disciples of the French composer Eric Satie, 1866 to 1925, something we'll discuss in just a moment. Under the heading of For Your Information, the utterly iconoclastic Eric Satie was the subject of Music History Monday on May 18th, 2021, and Dr. Bob Prescribes on May 19th, 2021. Having been booted out of the Paris Conservatoire twice, Satie became a compositional denizen of the Paris cabaret scene, and as such, 
his mature music grew from the parodistic and popular roots of the cabaret rather than from academia. He was your classic outsider, which made him a wildly popular figure among certain young Parisian composers in the 1920s. Another brief aside. In tomorrow's Dr. Bob Prescribes Post, we will observe the musical politics and aesthetic issues behind the deeply troubling 20th century modernist rejection of the music of the six. As for us here today, suffice it to say that life can in fact be nasty, brutish, and far too short, leaving us to embrace joy, grace, and beauty whenever and wherever we can find it. And we find it by the super tankerful in the music of Francis Poulenc. Background and Early Life Francis Poulenc was the youngest child of Emile Poulenc and his wife, Jenny, born Royer. For those, by the way, who are wondering why Poulenc's parents didn't name him Francois, I'm afraid I haven't a clue. Dude came from serious money. Poulenc's father, who was, by the way, a staunch Catholic, was a partner in Poulenc Frères, Poulenc Brothers, a pharmaceutical company, eventually the chemical and pharmaceutical giant Ron Poulenc. His mother Jenny was a native of Paris who played the piano and had a wide range of artistic interests. The music Jenny played at home ranged from the traditional classics to less elevated works. Salon music. Poulenc later said that his mother's pianistic repertoire gave him his lifelong taste for, quote, adorable bad music, unquote. Reflecting on the two sides of Poulenc's character, a deeply religious side inherited from his father and a worldly and artistic side inherited from his mother, the critic Claude Rostand described the mature Poulenc as being, quote, a bit of monk and a bit of hooligan, unquote. It's a phrase that happens to be the title of today's post. Poulenc began piano lessons at the age of five, and despite his near prodigy abilities, his father Emile insisted that he attend the prestigious Lycée Condorcet rather than a conservatory of music. Emile Poulenc's insistence was based on his intention that Francis be prepared to enter the family pharmaceuticals business when the time came, a career move that was not to take place. That's because in 1916, at the age of 17, Francis began taking piano lessons from Ricardo Vignes. Ricardo Vignes y Roda, 1875 to 1943, was a superb Spanish-born, Paris conservatoire-trained pianist who specialized in performing the most difficult contemporary repertoire, the new piano music of Debussy, Ravel, Thaya, Granados, Albany, Mussorgsky, Balakarev, and Prokofiev. Vignet's impact on the young Francis Poulenc was decisive. Poulenc later wrote about his teacher, Quote, he was a most delightful man, a bizarre hidalgo, with enormous mustachios, a flat brim sombrero in the purest Spanish style, and button boots, which he used to wrap my shins when I didn't change the pedaling frequently enough. I admired him madly, because at this time he was the only virtuoso who played Debussy and Ravel. Meeting with Vignes, was paramount in my life. I owe him everything. In reality, it is to Vignes that I owe my fledgling efforts in music and everything I know about the piano." Unquote. At the same time, domestic events removed the barriers to Polanc pursuing a career in music. His mother died when he was 16 and his father two years later, when Polanc was 18. The Six. 
It was through Ricardo Vignes that Poulenc met two composers who, along with Vignes, would be his formative compositional influences, Georges Auric, 1899-1983, and Eric Satie. Despite the fact that Poulenc and Auric were the same age, Auric was, at the time they met, which was circa 1918, far ahead of Poulenc in terms of his compositional development. Nevertheless, the two shared like musical tastes and ambitions, and they bonded like a warm tongue on a frozen metal strut. They remained best friends and confidants for the remainder of their lives. Poulenc called Auric, quote, my true brother in spirit, unquote. The strange, eccentric Eric Satie, though ignored by the French musical establishment, was nevertheless idolized by a generation of young French composers just because he wasn't a member of the establishment. Having examined Poulenc's early attempts at composition, Satie dismissed him as being nothing but a bourgeois amateur, which, in fact, Poulenc was at the time they first met. But soon enough Satie was singing another tune, and he allowed Poulenc to join his circle of protégés, whom Satie called Les Nouveaux Jeunes, the New Youngsters. Of the New Youngsters, Poulenc wrote, quote, We were tired of Debussy, of Ravel. I wanted music to be clear, healthy, robust, music as frankly French in spirit as Stravinsky's Petrushka is Russian." Unquote. A number of Satie's new youngsters all had works on a series of concerts in 1919. In a review, the Paris music critic Henri Collet referred to those new youngsters as the Groupe des Six and the designation the Six, like gum to a shoe, just stuck. Consequently, a group of six of Satie's protégés came to be known as Les Six Français et Monsieur Satie, the six French composers and Mr. Satie. They were Georges Auric, Louis Duré, 1888-1979, Arthur Honegger, 1892-1955, Darius Millot, 1892-1974, Poulenc, Germain Taifer, 1892-1983, and the group's spiritual mentor, Eric Satie. Darius Millot later remembered, quote, Quite arbitrarily, Collet had chosen six names, Auric, Duré, Honegger, Poulenc, Taifer, and my own, Merely because we knew each other, we were good friends, and had figured we had appeared on the same programs, quite apart from our different temperaments and wholly dissimilar characters. But it was useless to protest. Collet's article excited such worldwide interest that the group of six was launched, and willy-nilly I formed a part of it. This being so, we decided to give some Concert des Six, some concerts of the six. Satie was our mascot. He was very popular among us. The purity of his art, his horror of concessions, his contempt for money, and his ruthless attitude toward the critics were a marvelous example for us all." Unquote. Mio makes a very important observation here about Satie, particularly when it comes to the music of the first half of Francis Poulenc's compositional career. Eric Satie was the ultimate musical parodist and satirist, an outsider constantly tweaking the bulbous red noses of the Parisian musical establishment and academic community. Poulenc, as a musical outsider himself, one who received his compositional training on the job, was likewise drawn, early on, to musical farce and satire. Poulenc was particularly well received in Great Britain, both as a pianist and as a composer. In 1921, 
the famed British music critic Ernest Newman heard parts of what has been called Poulenc's deliciously absurd song cycle, Cocade, scored for soprano, cornet, trombone, violin, and percussion. Newman wrote in the Manchester Guardian, quote, I will keep my eye on Francis Poulenc, a young man who has only just arrived at his twenties. He ought to develop into a farceur, a farceur being the creator of farce, meaning a satirist and parodist. He ought to develop into a farceur of the first order." Unquote. Of course, Poulenc was much more than a mere farceur. When we return in tomorrow's Dr. Bob Prescribes, it will be with Poulenc's development as a composer of exquisitely beautiful religious music, vocal music, chamber and piano music, orchestral music, and piano concerti. Oh yes, and a screed about why listening to the music of Poulenc is good for us, despite the calumnies smeared upon it by the mid-20th century modernists. Until then, thank you. To sample and download one or all of my many courses on subjects musical produced by The Great Courses slash The Teaching Company, please visit my website at robertgreenbergmusic.com.